hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast, a talk show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, any part of their history, what's going on today, sometimes what might be happening in the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program, a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three other regulars. First of all, contributing writer for Billboard magazine, also Access.com, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have the senior editor for Beatle Fan magazine. He's been with them since the very beginning, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also we have our resident musicologist who also writes for Beatle Fan and is a freelance writer and for many years wrote for the New York Times in their classical department, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Well, this particular show is a very special one because we are celebrating 200 shows of Things We Said Today. And actually, in the tradition of the Traveling Wilburys, whose second album was called Volume 3, um, this show is actually episode 202, but we're calling it our 200th episode. Uh, and what we thought we'd all do in the show this time is to look back at, uh, at some of our favorite moments in the show. When we first started this program, it was just Steve and me, and it was basically a news-oriented show on the Beatles. And no one knows better than Steve how much the Beatles are in the news constantly, because that's <laughs> what he does on a daily basis. And there's been nobody better at cranking out the news on the Beatles every single day than Steve. And then we I'm turning red. I'm, I'm turning red, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's the truth. Who else does the, the kind of work that you do, and on a daily basis too? So um, we decided we were going to expand the show and have some more co-hosts, and that's when we invited Al and Alan to the program. So now we've made it to 200, really 202 shows, and so congratulations, guys. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about some of our favorite moments. So we've mm -hmm. each picked a clip which represents for each of us uh, a particular favorite moment. may not be our all-time favorite because there's so many shows to go through. But why don't we start with um, Alan? What was your okay. favorite moment? The one I picked, and, you know, it was really hard just sort of sampling through the first 200 shows or 199, I think, when we did it. And I think I sent you a couple of potential clips. But the one that we settled on was Lawrence Juber. It was several months ago. I can't remember exactly when. It, it was within the past year. And um, he came along and, uh, you know, apart from being really a... a a fantastic guitarist with a lot of interesting music and recordings of his own. Um, he obviously had a lot to tell us about what life was like in wings. And um, I believe at one point in the interview, he talks about having gone from being a studio musician where, you know, you come in every day, it's a different job. They put a part on your stand, you play what you're, you're given to going into a situation, you know, like with Wings, where, you know, you're not given a part, but you have some freedom to come up with your own ideas. Paul has ideas. And he put it in a, a, an interesting way, like, you know, uh, I, I was getting to learn what it was like to work with someone with that kind of ego. And I mean, when I say it, it, it sounds like it was a negative thing, but that's not the sense that came through when he said it, you know, just as a different kind of situation. And so I asked about that and he told us really what it was like to work in wings in, I thought, a fairly concise way. So that was that clip. You recently did uh, an interview, a video interview for Fretboard Journal. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned was that during your wings period, you were, to, to quote what you said, watching and learning and realizing how an artist like that functions. And I was wondering, how does an artist like that function? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a very <laughs> long conversation. I mean, basically, you know, I hadn't, I, I mean, I had gone to London University and I had a degree in music and I had, you know, these three, four years of, of solid studio work under my belt. But 
I had never really just had the luxury of being able to watch somebody on that level developing material, having the same kind of interaction that I was getting with Paul and seeing how he would approach things. And, you know, like the, the very first session that I did was for a song called Same Time Next Year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had, we recorded it and it was, and that was my first session. Um, Steve, Holly and I, both of us, our first session with Wings. And, and we recorded it and it was like, okay, well, you know, now we're going to put strings on this. And it's like seeing that process at work and then going up to Scotland and, you know, and we'd done that song, which was kind of a big movie-type feeling to it, kind of very cinematic, uh, even though I never got actually used in that movie, because uh, I think Marvin Hamlish ended up scoring it. Um, mm. Then the next thing we did was the song To You on Back to the Egg, which was, you know, very edgy. And the range, I mean, going from doing some, you know, very big kind of My Love-type you know, cinematic McCartney song to doing this very edgy kind of punky rock thing was a, such a strong contrast. And then in the course of recording, like there was one day where Paul said, you know, we're not going to work on the album today. I want to do some Rupert demos. And we spent a day demoing songs for, you know, this proposed Rupert the Bear movie. And it was just how broad in his case how broad his palette was Mm -hmm. and how easy it was for him to switch gears from one style to another and and because there was this kind of uber consciousness of this artistic consciousness that wasn't just driven by being in one genre but by by being an artist and a musician and a multi-instrumentalist and a producer and and being able to wear many hats, some of them at the same time. Mm-hmm. And being in the course of it, I mean, you know, one would assume that there's a, you know, there's a very strong ego at work there, which there is, but, but a very collaborative ego too. So it was, you know, a head that wore many hats, but it never really felt like it was too big, as it were. Mm. And following through on the metaphor. Yeah, I, w- I was wondering how collaborative that ego was. I mean, you, you were used to as a session musician being, and, and, and certainly also as one who, who reads, um, being given a chart, and this is what you play, and this is when you play it, and and that was really the the job of, of being a session musician. But in a band like Wings, how much room did you have to create your own lead lines, or did, did he suggest more or less what he wanted were you did you did you feel free to bring your own ideas to the to the tracks there was a lot of freedom i I think that you know being a studio musician had trained me in coming up with parts coming up with guitar parts because Mm -hmm. even though even though very often you're, you're handed something that's written there's also a certain amount of freedom to kind of invent the in-between licks or just find exactly the right rhythm groove or whatever. And with, with Wings, there was, there was, the freedom was there. I mean, there weren't that many occasions when Paul said, you have to play this. Mm-hmm. Now, there were certain times, for example, you know, with the riff to Old Siam, sir, I mean, that was written into the song. Um, right. Or, you know, the basic kind of groove of, of Spin It On. But when it came to the solos, for example, I was given really a lot of leeway. And... I was very happy to, to have that, uh, mm-hmm. and, and that really continued. I mean, there were only a few occasions where Paul said, I want you to play this, and that was, you know, times when things had been written in that were really part of the song. Like, um, there's a, in uh, Daytime, Nighttime Suffering, there's a little guitar lick that he said, I want, this is what I want, or, you know, I'm coming up this is the guitar lick that the, the whole thing is based on. And, and so, you know, that's compositional rather than more kind of musical direction where there's that certain freedom to be able to inject your own personality. Mm-hmm. I think the area where I, I felt like I was pushing the envelope was more in terms of the live show because Paul's not big on, you know, kind of extended guitar solos. So I really had to kind of pick my moments and and really try and kind of put my voice in there in my own way. So when we did Let It Be, for example, I wasn't trying to be George. I was trying to, you know, bring my sensibility to the solo on that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, but in the studio environment, I mean, I really felt that the freedom was there. And, you know, and the reality is if you didn't get it right, Paul could always pick up the guitar and do it himself. Right. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Steve? Are you surprised that, he, that I, I, just getting a little more general with Paul Lawrence, are you surprised he's still, to use the phrase of the uh, of the, the uh, tour out there, are you surprised he's still going as hard as he is? Not really, because I think he loves to perform. I think he just, he, he really, that's always, you know, being on stage is just so much built into his DNA. And I think that, you know, I mean, one could look at it that maybe there's a sense that if not now, when? Because, you know, if he stops doing it now, he's probably not going to do it again in five years. I mean, you know, let's just keep going while while the going's good. And he's got a big machine set up there. I mean, once you put that machine together, you kind of you want to keep it oiled. Otherwise, you know, you have to start over. And it's not easy to to put together a show of that scope. And to have the, you know to have such a tight band and and such a tightly put together stage show with all of that rigging. I mean, I can't imagine how much, how many man hours it takes to to put together his you know his staging. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And you know, I think it's just it's working. So why why not? You know, and it's not like he has you know. Whereas in 1980, it was like. You know, oh, we got busted in. I got busted in Japan. Now, you know, we don't want to take the kids out of school. I don't want to be, you know, dealing with, you know, immigration and all of that stuff. And he didn't travel for another ten, you know, nearly ten years. Whereas over the years, he kind of gradually started to ramp it back up. And now, you know, it's this. It's what he does. And and I and I think it's great that. He's doing it, and he's, you know, he's certainly satisfying his audiences. He puts on a great show, and there's no shortage of material. You know, he's never going to run out of tunes to play live. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely true. Ken? Lawrence, you were just talking about how, you know, in your view, you, you looked at Wings as being a very collaborative type of effort. Do you separate the Wings period from post-Wings? Paul? Is it all? There are some people who think no matter what, it's Paul's music no matter what. And he still could be collaborative with all the people that he worked with on all of the solo albums anyway. So, do you view the, the Wings period as being something that is separate from everything else that he did in yes. his post Beatles career? And why? Well, the, the short answer is yes, because in my view, Wings was not Paul's band, it was Paul and Linda's band. And as much as, you know, Linda made her contribution in so in some very specific ways that, you know, I, I found her to be very much part of the rock and roll heart of the band because Paul can go in a very pop direction. And, and the reality is that, you know, Wing's biggest hits in the 70s were pop hits, you know, whether it's, you know, listen to what the man said, let him in, my love, you know, this wasn't the, the big hits weren't really the hard rock side of the band, but Linda kept kept things rocking from my perspective. And her voice was also a very integral part. Hers and Denny's and Paul's voices blending were very much that strong backing vocal sound that you identify with those hit records, just as much as you know the sound of the Bee Gees records or, or 10CC or those bands in the 70s that used, that, that used a very strong vocal ensemble sound. Um, mm. And so... You know, she was very integral to it, even though she got a lot of criticism for her, you know, supposed lack of musicianship. She made up for it in other ways. And I think that by the time we got to Back to the Egg, it was, I think she was starting to disengage because, you know, James was, was a baby. She now had four kids. They'd done the big world tour thing. And then Paul getting busted, it, which of course, I mean, came after the album, but it, it just, it, it was a progression to the point where, Wings really ceased to become that entity. And then Paul went on, you know, to be doing whole records. And yes, Linda may have been involved, but it wasn't the same level of involvement as with Wings, where she was a constant presence. All right. So what did you guys think, looking back on that clip with Lawrence Juber? How about you, Al? He, he always has a, a, very, a very interesting take 
on you know the whole the whole wings experience maybe a little bit different from uh from you know any of the other the other members of the group and uh but but it's always a very you know a very very intelligent uh take mhm mm yeah i think what i found very interesting about it was um what he had to say about linda's contribution exactly mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. And I think it's it's really true if you if you look back at Paul's entire post Beatles career, there is a big difference between the Wings period and post Wings, as far as Linda's contribution, because there was much more of a presence with Linda on Wings records. Not that there wasn't one with the solo stuff, but you can definitely hear more harmonies. You know, you 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 definitely felt like she was more a part of the recordings right there. Oh yeah, because she had a particular harmony sound that uh that you know really um in, in fact it's, it's weird there's a story that that um uh around the time when run devil run came out i'm not sure if i've told this before but uh, there are a couple of tracks on run devil run where there are some harmony parts that sound very much like linda and of course, it can't be because the album was recorded a year after she after she passed. And somebody had mentioned that to Paul, and he had said, "Yeah, that he he noticed it himself." Mm -hmm. So definitely, there was she had a, a very uh, there she was very much a, a part of the sound of Winks. I think what I found interesting about what he said about her is that she was the one pushing them towards the rock stuff. Yes, you know? exactly. And, uh, yeah, so that, that that surprised me. I don't know why it surprised me. I guess it kind of makes sense, but um, you know, he has that duality. He's the, the he's the rock screamer and also the gentle balladeer, and mm -hmm. um, she was pushing for the one side. Right. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think it's always interesting to see how various people work with, with which we'll, you know, we'll hear again. But it's just, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear these kind of perspectives that you wouldn't normally otherwise know, you know. Um, and Lawrence's was, you know, I mean, Lawrence's was at a very interesting time. So uh, that actually we don't hear a lot about. So, yeah, I mean, that's, it's really, especially from somebody like him who's, you know, such a professional. I always say if you want the full perspective of what an artist is like to work with, you interview all the people around that person. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the more people that you hear from, then you'll get a fuller appreciation. And certainly, just from the Wings period, I've interviewed most of the other members of Wings. They all have something different to say. Mm -hmm. and so, um, And definitely Lawrence has a very positive uh, perspective of it all. And, you know, the whole thing about Linda, it's funny because I noticed that even though Linda, you don't feel her presence as much after Wings, after she passed away, I really noticed a difference in Paul's music. I felt like something was missing. And it really makes you realize how much a part she had to do with that sound. And like sure. you said, Al, the harmonies. I mean, the yeah. Wednesdays, it was Paul, Linda, and Denny. And they were so much yeah. part of that sound, the blending of those voices. And uh, there are certain songs you can easily cite, oh. like, you know, with a little luck and silly love songs. and Listen, you know. listen to what the man said. Sure, mm -hmm. those songs. Yeah. And it's just not there, uh, you know, after Linda... You know, after Linda passed away, you noticed a big, big difference. At least I did, anyway. Mm -hmm. hmm. All yeah. right, so why don't yeah. why don't we move on now to uh, Steve and the clip that you picked? Well, this kind of segues very nicely with the Lawrence clip because it's our interview with Rusty uh, Anderson that was from 2013. I can't believe it was that long ago, but it was, and we caught him, as I recall. In between shows, they were still on tour, but we got him in between shows. We were really lucky to get him. And he talked about how they played together on stage, how this, the, the current band works on stage, which, you know, if you've seen the band or if you will see the band, for example, this week, you will see this in, in play. And, and I don't know, recall that I've ever heard that many descriptions from the band. I know, you know, when I talked to Brian Ray, uh, uh, I I heard some of it, 
but I mean, what Rusty's Rusty's uh, comments were really interesting for me. So, yeah, that's why I picked him. So why don't we hear the clip from Rusty Anderson? Can you go through one thing I've always been curious about when you're dealing with songs that are classics, and so many of these songs are, especially the Beatles songs and certain solo songs that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Is there a tendency for you to say? I've got to be loyal to the way George Harrison played it or the way it was on the record, or does Paul just let you have freedom to do whatever you want? Well, it's sort of a hybrid. I mean, I, I think that, that one of the reasons that this band has been together a long time and has worked well is because everyone kind of gets it. They, they sort of, I think their, their perspective, and certainly mine, is like you want to honor the classic arrangements of these songs because they're so brilliant, but you also don't want to just karaoke it and and just do everything exactly like copy every nuance i mean i think it's important be, uh, it, it's there's a multitude of of aspects going on one is it's important to to put one's personality into the moment of the event of playing the playing the song because it's live it's a live performance and there's not we don't have a click track going on we don't have computers playing stuff it's not machine music and a lot of the music that you hear live is that way, you know. Right. Uh, a lot of drummers out there. You see a drummer, but he's actually got a little thing in his ear and a little click, click track going, and everything's on a grid, and all these other instruments are playing things. That's the opposite of of what we are. We're an organic band, and I think that, you know, I mean, if the Beatles were alive today and they were playing these songs or Wings or whoever, that it wouldn't be this like sort of carbon copy uh, approach to making the music. It's more about sort of making it work in a live medium and having that urgency and i think that it's important to keep that feel going and uh so um, i think you know the response has been pretty great uh, as far as that as far as i think our interpretations of the song and it's it's a, it's sort of walking that line of, of being respectful and also not being too respectful to the point of uh you know just being a, a carbon copy right is there an unknown every night when you go out there that you don't know what you're going to be, do- what everybody else is going to be doing, and you kind of play. Oh off yeah, that. you know, we'll make mistakes. We'll start songs again. Well, you know, there's it's it's actually kind of loose. You know, I mean, we there's a lot of focus, and I think when you're on the road and you play a lot, and you 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 get pretty tight. But there's also a time when maybe someone will misread the set list, or <laughs> you know, we've we've done some funny things. But it's always cool. There's there's a nice. It seems to be that there's a, a good vibe in the audience when those moments happen because. Everyone knows then it's actually live, and that um, that they're seeing something that isn't, you know, the same exact thing every night. Right. And yeah, there's also they're... improvised solos. You know, I'll go up and do things uh, different. I mean, it's a little different every night. I never. And that's never what keeps had it fresh. Exactly the same performance any two nights, or certainly Paul doesn't. Yeah. What's the what's the, it, it, as you know as much as you can say? What's the process of uh, adding to the set list? Uh, I think you said before when we talked that you guys do have input, that it's not just Paul making the Yeah, decisions. yeah. I used to have, I re- used to be a little more assertive about my opinion mm-hmm. and, you know, just try to, you know, nudge Paul, hey, we should do blah, 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 or this, you know. And, you know, I suggested, say, you know, uh, too many people or um, day tripper, getting better, helter skelter, things like that. But as time's gone on, I've seen how, you know, you could have, you could ask a million people what the set list should be, and you'd get a million different responses. Everyone from the super fans to the, you know, the sort of occasional listeners have a different opinion about what songs they want to hear. Right. And so, you know, you can't be too, um, what's the word, myopic about it, because it's not that kind of a thing. And, I mean, there's certain songs that I like better than others, but at the same time, you know, uh, it, it is a group committee kind of thing, because it's, it's the committee of the whole audience and all around the world. It's the committee of the band. And, you know, ultimately, Paul, you know, calls the shots. But I think he views it that way, too, that he's not just doing it for himself. He's doing it for the whole, you know, for the tour. So. Mm-hmm. Did you guys, when you, because one of the things, we did a whole show on the first uh, on the first show on the tour and all the set list changes, and we were just, we were absolutely floored at the, at the, some of the songs you guys brought in. We, I mean, we were, we were, very pleased. And, well, and I was, I was too, most surprised with being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Yeah. I know. I was, too. That's something Paul just wanted to play. Like, cool. 
So then uh, that, that took some work because it's, it's such a, an elaborate arrangement of instruments and sounds that, you know, aren't very uh, uh, commonplace. So. Right. Were you hearing the, the, what what people were asking for, what the super fans were asking for, or did you guys just go in and say we're just going to change things up and and you know do what do what sounds good? I think it's a combo. I'm not even sure really. I know that 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 a lot of people might write into Paul's website and ask for things, and they always that you know making suggestions to me, and sometimes I I go oh yeah that's a great idea. You know, or sometimes they go, "I've never heard that song," and then finally listen to it, and it's like maybe it's an okay song with an amazing vocal, or mm-hmm. it's uh, it's this cool song, but it you know it's not really the right instrumentation for this band, or you know, there's a lot of things. And plus, Paul has so many songs, That's right. so many records. I mean, it's, it's the output is is ridiculous. You could play all these songs, these obscure songs, but most people wouldn't know them. They, you know, most people in the audience know the the songs that got radio airplay. Right. So, which is a lot of them already. I mean, you just take the hits and you're done. You know, you don't have to look any farther, which which is unusual because most artists aren't that, you know, endowed with <laughs> with hit songs. He's had a lot of hits that he's never done live still. Exactly. Can we expect set list changes down the road and can we also expect a recording or a DVD? Um, set list can you changes. Say anything? It always morphs. Um, but you know, it depends how long it takes. Okay. Uh, the set list, you know, and from one, it might even be called the same tour, but there might be a couple of different songs or okay. whatever. I mean, I know that this tour out there, uh, there's been a, a lot of set changes. And as far as DVDs and stuff, uh, I don't know. I bet, I kind of bet there will be, but I haven't heard any specific uh, plans for it. Can I ask one last question about the tours? Sure. Um, I've noticed that through the years, Paul has done certain songs in Europe. That he won't do in the U.S. songs like "Come Mull and Get of It." Kintyre. Uh, well, uh, "Mull of Kintyre" at certain areas, he will do "Mull of Kintyre." But I, I'm talking about "Come and Get It" recently. The word he did, "You won't see me." I say he. I mean you guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those songs are, are. Is there a reason why he only does it in that area? That's and then... a good question. I might ask the same question. I don't really know. I mean, I know that, for instance, uh, uh, "Hope of Deliverance" uh, was was big in Latin America and I think Germany, so that's where we played it. We haven't played it here because of that. As far as, like, Beatle tunes, uh, Come and Get It or, or You Won't See Me or whatever, I think that was just sort of happenstantial, sort of random. I, I don't think it's been really that uh, sort of clocked or deliberate. And, you know, those songs have sort of been thrown around, maybe You Won't See Me or some of those, and who knows, they might end up back in the set list. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't really know what to say about them. Okay. Okay. Well, surprise us and do Mullock and Tire here, will you? <laughs> uh, well, that usually we do with the uh, with the uh, the full on uh, bagpipe band, in right? Certain areas, you know, like say Scotland or some places in Canada, you know, mm-hmm. will actually have a bagpipe band. But you know, and and the song was a huge hit in certain areas, right? You know, right. so it's it's sort of uh, what do you call it uh, regionally appropriate, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, Rusty, it was you that suggested too many people? Yes. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that song. It's cool, right? <laughs> oh, it's a great song. No, no doubt about it. Really it really is. You know, I wish he'd do more from Ram, but, you know, like we said, there's so much in his catalog. You know, yeah, he can't you do have all of them. kind of look at the whole big picture because it is, it's a worldwide event. It's not just, you know, if you have some cult favorite band and you go see them and they, you know... That's one thing, but it's like the biggest cult on the planet, kind of. So what did the rest of you think of that clip? Al, what did you think of the uh, clip right there with Rusty Anderson? Uh, interesting. It's a different uh, different dynamic than, uh, than, than, than Lawrence, because in, in Rusty's case, it's, you know, it's, it's very obvious that it's, you know, that there isn't quite the, uh, the effort to for the the members of the group to be kind of like equals, you mm-hmm. know, part of a, you know, part of an ongoing band, uh, that it's, that Paul is very much in charge, but they, uh, uh, but they also, you know, they also have, they have a, you can tell they have a lot of fun together on stage. No, no question about that. 
Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, if you listen to the clip, um, I think it was me that asked the question, what do you do when you're doing a Beatles song? And here you are, you're the lead guitarist. You know, yeah. you try to copy what George Harrison did or... Mm -hmm. you know, and he pretty much said that, you know, you have to inject some of yourself into the performance, too, just to mm -hmm. try to make it your own and still be respectful of the Beatles recording. But I found it really interesting when he said, and I thanked him, <laughs> that he that he asked Paul to put too many people into the set list. So, uh, again, thank you, Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, yeah, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I think Al basically covered it. I mean, but the thing is, it's it's it is always interesting to hear what the uh, sidemen or collaborators, you know, as the the shifting job description of working with Paul tends to go. And and Rusty Anderson is a really great guitarist. I mean, I I personally feel I know there are people who are for some reason that I can't understand very critical of this band. I think this is in some ways the the best band in terms of pure musicianship that he ever worked with and that includes the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles were great being the Beatles, but these guys are really, really polished players who can do anything. I mean, I, I've been very impressed hearing them. So it was good to hear what he had to say. But at this point, they know each other so well. Mm -hmm. know, sure. Just, uh, you know, a well, uh, well honed act. Yeah. Well, Paul has said it himself that, uh, that now they've been together longer than, you know, than either the Beatles or Wings, you know, any, any, you know, cumulatively any of the lineups of Wings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this band has been with him longer. Right. And even with Wix, it's been even longer than those musicians. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, right. Absolutely. Going all the way back to, uh, you know, Flowers in the Dirt. To Flowers in the Dirt. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. All right. I'm going to talk about the clip that I chose. And actually, it wasn't with one of our guests. It was with one of our own. And that being Alan Cozen, we did a show on the Beatles' greatest miracles in the studio, which uh, I thought would be a pretty good idea because there are so many of them. And uh, we all, we all kind of picked our favorites of things that were just beyond belief of what the Beatles achieved in the studio. The one that I personally picked was Strawberry Fields Forever. And so it was sheer delight that when I asked Alan to come up with his number one choice, it turned out to be the same thing that I picked. So he got to speak on behalf of Strawberry Fields Forever. But he couldn't have done a better job, and that's why I chose this particular clip. So let's listen in on it. All right, Alan, I'm going to let you have your, your choice now, and I'll bet you it's probably my, my number one choice, too, but I'm going to let you have it anyway. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Ken. Is your number one choice Strawberry Fields? Yes. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's something about Strawberry Fields, I, I just love that track. It's, it, it could be my favorite Beatles track of all, and, and that's, you know, as you know, the competition's pretty tough. Strawberry, one of the reasons, possibly, that I feel this way about Strawberry Fields, although, although I, I, I've always loved it from the time it came out, is that thanks to bootlegs, or the miracle of bootlegs, we have basically all of the working materials for Strawberry Fields, starting from when John was in Almeria, Spain, with an acoustic guitar and a cassette mm -hmm. recorder. Um, and had one line of the song written. And then, you know, the next tape, he has two or three lines. And it's not until later in the process that, you know, but, but still in Almeria, where he comes up with the let me take you down to Strawberry Fields part. But then he's got nothing to get mad about instead of nothing to get hung about. It, it's, it's incredible to see this thing unfolding. And even when they went to Abbey Road and did the first takes, it's beginning with the verse, you know, um, rather than, you know, let me take you down to Strawberry Fields is really the, the chorus and the refrain. And it didn't begin with that at first. It, it began with uh, one of the verses. I think, I think actually it began with a different verse than all of the demos started with, uh, Living is Easy. But anyway, um, the thing about Strawberry Fields that's so incredible is that 
it was such a mess. I mean, if you think about the fact that John had done all these demos and you hear a lot of the roots of the song in the demos, then took it into the studio, played it for them on an acoustic guitar, which is beautiful by itself. Then they did the first version, which has that slide, which turns out actually to most likely be a Mellotron, not George. That slide guitar on take one, because there's a Mellotron guitar sound that sounds exactly like that. Are you sure about I'm that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it, but someone made the case and included a tape of the Mellotron sound, and it's very, very close to that sound, which wasn't really the way George sounded. Even when he was playing slide more, he, he, he didn't go for that sharp sound that you hear. But I don't know. It's, uh, it's possibly George. It may very well be the Mellotron. But in any case, uh, you know, and then uh, on the third verse of that first take, they come in with those harmonies like on Because or, you know, some earlier things like uh, Here, There and Everywhere, you know, just that beautiful Beatles harmony thing, which Mm. astonishingly, when they put out the version of that take on the anthology, they didn't include those vocals. I have no idea why. Mm. Uh, they're on bootlegs. They when they had the Abbey Road show in I think 1983, and they played a film with some of these outtakes. They included those vocals, but on the anthology they didn't. And the funny thing is that you know it also had that beautifully slinky bass sound, um, which was apparently George, because Paul was manning the Mellotron. So John took that home, decided he didn't like it. Came in, they started again, opening now with Paul's. Mellotron flute sounds, um, which is, you know, a signature part of that, you know, of that song. You hear those flutes and yeah, that's Strawberry Field. It could be nothing else, you know. So they, they did, uh, you know, six or seven takes of that. They had a, a decent version, took it home, still didn't like it. Commissioned George Martin to write an orchestral score for which he just used cellos and brass. And I found... Um, Actually, um, once once Mark Lewison let me look through his listening notes, and, uh, <laughs> and I noted in there that George Martin put in a requisition for to be paid for his uh, orchestral score for Strawberry Fields, and he earned a mere thirty six pounds on that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so maybe in nineteen sixty seven it was worth a bit more than it would be now, but still mm-hmm. not much. Mm-hmm. They recorded it that way, an incredible th- version with, um, you know, also the Swarmandel, which is a sort of Indian zither that, you know, contributes again to that special sound that Strawberry Fields has. Finished that version. Oh, oh and they, they started off those sessions doing a drum track with um, Neil Aspinall and Paul joining in on timpani. And it's a very noisy thing. Um, and they intended to use it partly as the underpinning of the of the end of the piece, but also to have it played backwards. And that sort of, you hear that in the coda. Um, and you also, when you listen to the raw sessions, you hear John say cranberry sauce very clearly, not once, but twice. And on the, on the finished version, you know, it's, it, it sounds different because it's slowed down. You know, mm. George Martin, when he did his orchestral score, moved the key up because he wanted to get the open strings of the, the lowest open string of the cellos into the thing because he liked that sound. So he moved it up a key and it was apparently okay for John to sing. They also took it faster. John takes that home, still doesn't like it, says, I want you to make a version that has bits of both of these. And this is where the miracle really happens. I mean, they did a lot of miracles, but this was, you know, this was just an incredible one that the one that was in the higher key was also faster. So you could speed up the slower one, slow down the faster one and the keys met in the middle so that you could make that splice that happens at exactly one minute into the song. It just changes texture and, uh, you know, goes from the band version, the second version into the orchestral version with the heavy drums and the Swarmandel. And then George has a guitar solo and then there's the, that it fades out. You get the backwards drums, fades back in with the Mellotron going crazy. 
and you hear John saying cranberry sauce, although we never knew that he was saying that for not at the time, certainly. I thought it sounded to me like he's saying I'm very bored for some reason, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when the Paul's Dead rumors started, it was I buried Paul. Uh Um, But he had the greatest explanation of it. He said, listen, John's saying cranberry sauce. And if you knew John, you would know that he was likely to say something like cranberry sauce at any minute. And, you know, so it didn't seem strange to us. (laughs) But uh, Mm. so, you know, then a from all of that, you know, what we have here is like a technical miracle that this whole thing came together out of, you know, so many attempts into a sort of Frankenstein version that is just perfect. And beyond that, you've got the lyrics, you know, the lyrics are just incredible. You know, for most of us who knew the backstory, we knew what Strawberry Fields was, or technically it's Strawberry Field singular is that mm-hmm. the orphanage john but you know even if you didn't know that it's just a nice image a nice image that evokes you know color in your mind you know strawberry field wow you know and Mm -hmm. and and it was just you know the song was so sort of early psychedelia and you know strawberry fields nothing is real nothing to get hung about sung so laconically you know and you keep in mind that they just came off this horrific tour where you know, they all had a horrible time every place they went. And, you know, in, even in the U.S. where there was the John and Jesus thing and they played that show in Memphis and a firecracker went off and everyone mm. turns to see whether John shot, you know. Uh, and it, it's, uh, you know, and this sort of comes out of that, you know, he's looking at all of these, the, you know, what they just went through, the fact that they just were not going to do it anymore. They were going to they were going to go in the studio. That was going to be their life. And um, and he's just saying, you know, OK, you know, nothing's real, nothing to get hung about. No big deal. We're just doing our thing and living is easy with eyes closed. Mm. You know, it's, it's <laughs> misunderstanding all you see. It's just great. I can listen to Strawberry Fields over and over and over. And, you know, thanks to the bootlegs, you can listen to it over and over in many, many different <laughs> ways. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that was that's my thing about the strawberry fields. That's that's my uh, top top drawer Beatles miracle. Well, I can't put it any better than you just did, Alan. Mm-hmm. But um, it was my number one choice too. But the main reason being because of those two different versions. And what is the likelihood that any band is going to record two different takes of a song, and have one version be not only faster but in a in a higher key, mm-hmm. you know? And you'll be able to speed one up and slow one down, and they're going to match. Yeah. And even if we didn't know the history of all this, if you weren't told that, you probably wouldn't know they were two different takes right. because they really are edited together so well. Yeah. You know, now it's very obvious because we have the knowledge. You know, it's at that one minute point, but it all flows together so well. And uh, it, it's just uh, an incredibly it's it's a marvelous recording. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just interesting what you were saying, Alan, about. You know, the key being higher because George Martin wrote an orchestration there for a higher key. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, but it's just remarkable that that worked out the way it did. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it it could easily not have worked. And but, you know, it's funny if if you didn't know all that stuff and you listen to it, you know, with a very sort of analytical musical ear, you would have to say, well, how did they do this? It starts off as a band Mm -hmm. and then. You know, and then it becomes something completely else. It, it does. It, the transition is incredibly smooth, and yet you've got two totally different worlds in this song. And it, it's not like an orchestra just comes in and joins them. It's it. The band, to some degree, falls out, except for the the drums, and then George's guitar comes back in. And you know, it's it really is uh, the, the everything after minute one is so different. That if you were to try to analyze, if you were to try to write a score of how this piece is made, it, you'd be scratching your head, you know, because it's, it's mm-hmm. just so different mm-hmm. and so strange. Yeah. All right. That was an amazing looking back at the whole process of Strawberry Fields Forever. You could and what a, a voice. <laughs> <laughs> what delivery. Now, was that all off the top of your head there, Alan, or did you just um, did it just come right out of you naturally? Um, 
Pretty much. I mean, uh, I'm not sure exactly whether I think it was before I did. I ended up doing a Wall Street Journal piece about strawberry fields. They have a column called Masterpieces. And, you know, normally it's like, you know, you write a piece about how a a Mozart symphony or a Monteverdi uh, choral work or something was was done. And I pitched Strawberry Fields as a masterpiece I wanted to write about. And they were very open to it. And I think actually our show was quite a while before I wrote the piece and um, then just sort of revisited, you know, sort of my comments. Um, But I mean, I've been so fascinated with strawberry fields for so many years that um, in a way it was, it was off the top of my head, but I've sort of been delving into strawberry fields on and off over the years, listening to all of those outtakes and, and things like that. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's very present for me. I mean, I could do it off the top of my head again, if you want me to. (laughs) Uh, well, I just think what you said was perfect. You know, you really couldn't top it. So, um, yeah, and yeah, that was pretty, that was, it was, that was a fun show. That was a fun show too, because the, the Beatles do tons of studio miracles. And, uh, I think there was a lot for all of us to dig into. We should do a studio miracles part two. I think that would be, that would be fun. Yeah. But that was that particular section was really fascinating because when I when I did listen to it uh, when I listened to it back uh, last week it's you know the way he breaks down the you know the 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 chronology of the you know the building of Strawberry Fields Forever is is really fascinating listening at least I think at least I think so. And just the mere fact that so much of what they did just fell into place without it planning to be that way. <laughs> yes. Just, right, yeah. right. <laughs> That's part of the miracle yeah. of it all. Right. right. Yeah. So many, you know, almost mistakes that happen to be just the perfect thing, you know. That's so great. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the clip that Al has chose. Al? Okay. Um, uh, this one is, uh, um, well, Alan and I are not really too objective about this because it's, uh, it's from a, a friend of ours and a, a member of the Beatle fan family going back almost to the very beginning. And that's the interview we did with, uh, with Rick Glover. Who is uh, the uh, another one of the senior editors of uh, of Beatle Fan? But it's also, you know, most people know him as Mister Mister Fans on the Run. Uh, he's uh, one of the one of the guys along with Bob Gannon, who has probably seen more McCartney and 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 Ringo concerts than. Uh, probably most of us put together and the episode that uh that uh, that rick guested on uh he he talked about he talked about well f- uh, for one thing meeting paul at the um outside of the hitsville museum in uh, in detroit which was almost totally by accident but in this particular clip it was uh, the fact that uh, that uh, a little over a year ago uh, Rick got the opportunity to be called up uh, up on stage to meet with Paul. Of course, Paul Paul has has known him for you know a good number of years because of the fact that he's been at so many shows, and so he's a familiar a familiar face. And Paul's crew uh, knows him very well. But uh, but this was uh, his particular uh, his particular chance to to kind of be in the limelight. And uh, here's the way uh, the way Rick descri- uh, describes it. How did it happen? I mean, what? What happened before to get you up on stage? Well, I uh, I had never made any type of sign other than just the banner that said "Fans on the Run" for all the other shows since really since the '90s. I'd been making the sound sign banner for the uh, from the audience the sh- uh, just to say hello to Paul, "Fans on the Run," and uh, I realized I was coming up on sort of a milestone of the 135th show there. So I thought it might be uh, might actually I thought it might give him a little kick to see someone out there in the audience that uh, has been to 130 that many shows, you know? And uh, so I did make a special sign for that show that said 135th shows. And then a friend of mine named Dave Takis had made these really, really groovy little fans on the run buttons that are a play on the 
album cover for Wings at the Speed of Sound that says Fans on the Run in this uh, similar artwork from that album cover. And I had uh, given those out to my fellow Fans on the Run, lot, lots of folks that uh, we've traveled or seen each other at least on the shows over all these years. And uh, uh, David had made a, um, a batch of those buttons and I gave, um, gave one to a lot of my personal friends. And then throughout the course of the week, I'd run into, well, all the members of the band, uh, Wicks, uh, Rusty, um, Abe, and Brian. I'd all been able, always already been able to get a button, the Fans on the Run button to those guys, running into them at the hotel or restaurants around towns and things like that. So I thought it'd be really, really great if I could actually hand the, the bass player one for um, to complete the set. So I made the sign that said, uh, it's my 135th show. Could I please give you a fans on the run button? And uh, he's Paul saw that. And um, during the encore break, that's when the uh, security guy for Paul usually comes out and finds the uh, the folks that are going to be pulled up on stage. And he was looking around in an area that I was not sitting in and thought, well, he he was he'd chosen someone else. And then all of a sudden, uh, Brian Riddle, the security guy came from sort of behind the uh, the seats and told me that I was uh, I would been chosen to go up so we just scurried down the aisle and uh, waited over beside the stage before Paul started uh, coming up so the answer is uh, I didn't know myself until just a few uh, moments after Paul had left the stage for the encore break wow wow Al hmm. now they all uh, if I'm remembering correctly they all know you because, I mean, well, after all, have all, all the shows you've been to, and you're, yeah. you're always right down front. So I'm assuming, after all these years, that they know you. The, the, his security folks have seen me a whole, exactly. a whole lot, for sure. So, and uh, actually, through Facebook, I've been at least uh, chatting back and forth with several of the band members as well. Sure. And uh, a lot of his crew do uh, recognize me by sight. Now, when you say, do, I, do we know each other, or the, do they know me? Only, only by sight and a wave at the uh, at the shows and things like that. I, I don't bother them or try to distract them from the jobs that they've got to do during the shows. But uh, over the years, uh, we've gotten uh, more and more. It's, it's kind of like seeing old friends that you you know know casually at least. And a few of them actually do know me. It's, it sounds strange to say this, but know me by name at least because yeah. we've chatted so many times over the years. Yeah, well, Paul and, certainly uh, does. Paul mentioned, in fact, that uh, when when I was uh, walking out, he says, we know this guy, we've seen him everywhere, or because he's been to 135 shows or something like that. Sure, you got to tell the uh, story about uh, the Hitsville uh, meeting. Oh, sure, yeah, well, that that uh, happened about, uh, gosh, I guess it's been three or four years now, yeah. wow, when we were up at the um, up in Detroit to see Paul play the concert up there. And uh, all this, de the details of this story were all in a, a special issue of Beatle Fan Magazine when right. that happened. And um, but I, I just went to the museum to go to the museum, and as I'm leaving, four big SUV limos pulled up, and uh, Paul bounces out of one of them, and then he. Mm, I, this sounds so strange to say it this way without saying, "Hey, hey, look at me," but um, Paul got out of the limo and looked like he immediately recognized me and sure. actually introduced me to his wife, Nancy, to yeah. uh, as the guy that's been to so many shows and asked me how many I'd been to at that time. But she, oh. the funniest reaction to that was when she says, oh, I know, I know. So uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they, do, they, they do recognize the fans that are there regularly. I, I, I know that for sure. Sure. You know, he has a really good memory for faces. I've seen it in mm -hmm. action myself. Um, I interviewed him in 1990 the first time, and that was really the only time we had met. And a year or, or more later, he did a press conference at uh, Carnegie Hall because he was going to do uh, Liverpool Oratorio there. And mm -hmm. after he got off stage, he... Um, asked the Carnegie security people if that was me and if they could bring me back because he wanted to talk to me about my review of the Liverpool Oratorio. I went uh -oh. to Liverpool to cover it. <laughs> no, well, um, 
it was generally a positive review yeah. anytime you were giving it a chance because everyone else was so snide about it. Right. Um, <laughs> but I, I was, I was, you know, struck. I mean, you know, I spent maybe an hour or a little more than an hour with the guy over a year before, and he sees millions of people, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and why would he remember me? I mean, so uh, I, I was kind of struck by that because of the, the number of people that he sees, you know, and so it, it doesn't surprise oh. me that he recognized you. I mean, you're at so many of the shows and you've got the banner and, uh, you know, and, and, and I think he, you know, I think he, he's someone who I think really engages with his fans who are, oh, yeah, you know, who are, are seriously sort of devoted to his work. I think he appreciates that as big as he is, you know, it's, it's, it's just mm-hmm. something about him. Well, so, I think yeah. he appreciates it too, and uh, that's one of the reasons that I I've done it to let him know that at least there are still a, f- a few of us uh, diehards, uh, certainly enthusiastic fans, that uh, want to be there to uh, to support him and let him know that um, you know we we love him <laughs> and we appreciate the the things that he's uh, he's he's done for for us both sort of mu- well, certainly musically and kind of personally. It's affected. Uh, affected so many lives in so many ways and sure i'm certainly one of them that got the effect and never got over it so many years ago rick uh, i got two questions first of all there's a photo that you've posted on facebook and it's a close-up of you and paul is that from the hitsville experience oh yes yeah, yeah that, the, okay uh, where we're shoulder to shoulder outside yeah yeah yeah, yeah right. that happened at the just as we were leaving well uh the details on that when I uh, when I saw Paul really approaching me, I just had all I had to do was stand still when he when he was coming there. His security man got between me and Paul, and there there were a couple other uh, photographers there from Motown too, and uh, one of them had a, a large card that looked like it looked like he was going to ask for an autograph basically. And his security guy said, "No, no autographs, no autographs here. On the uh, we're just here off we're off the clock or something like that." <laughs> so. Uh, I didn't ask him for an autograph at that at that time because I've already had already got his autograph. But um, when I said, "Oh, I asked him if I could do it, maybe do a photo with him," he said, "Sure, man, let's do it," and put his arm around my my shoulder. And I was trying to do this self portrait, uh, you know, the selfie thing with the long arm, mm-hmm. and uh, my hand was sh- <laughs> my hand was shaking so bad. <laughs> Paul noticed that my hand was shaking, and all we were going to get was a blur. So he suggested. Well, actually, he told me. He says, "Give it to him." Pointing to the security man, he's good at it. So he uh, he's the one that ended up taking taking the photo of us outside the uh, the Motown Museum there. <laughs> Very nice. We just heard from Rick Lover talking about his experience going on stage with Paul McCartney and a few other things too related to Paul and the other band members. What do you think, guys? How about you, Steve? I, you know, having, you know, having, uh, um, I mean, I, I think some of you guys, are, Al, for example, I think you know Rick probably a little better than I do, but just hearing sure. that great story, a great story. I mean, you know, him talk about that and and getting called up there. I mean, you know, I've t- I've interviewed several people that have been called up, and uh, you know, the stories are all great, but. You know, Rix is unique, not for the fact that he's been there, uh, not just for the fact that he's been there so many times at so many shows, but because he is, you know, if there's a definition of fan, Rick is definitely it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not, I mean, there are, there are some people that, you know, go around trying to make names for themselves, but not, you know, Rick is, I mean, the fans on the run thing just kind of took off on its own, you know, and, and it, it's really a testament to him and his, and, and, you know, to be recognized kind of by the band like that is, is just very cool. So, and we could all relate to that, how many of us would love to be in his shoes. Well, some of us may not want to be up on stage in front of thousands of people looking at you, but um, (laughs) to be on stage right next to Paul and having Paul acknowledge him, I mean. It's mm-hmm. like the dream of a lifetime for so many yeah. years. So, but he was very he was very cool about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was, and uh, and and you know the the irony is that you know it wasn't too much longer after that that Rick was diagnosed with uh, with uh, with cancer, which fortunately, uh, you know, a year or so later, he appears to have beaten. Which is mm-hmm. the you know the ult- the ultimate good news. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, 
Yeah, I found it actually very moving to to hear him yeah. tell that story. You know, I mean, he he didn't do it in anything like a, you know a mawkish or you know no. over dramatic way. But it, you know, it's just like okay, this is you know it's someone you know who. Uh, <laughs> You know, who's met Paul plenty of times, but this was just a special moment. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I I, really enjoyed hearing him tell it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe it's the accent, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Not only that, but I don't know if you guys caught this, but I know I saw on Facebook that on a fairly recent show that Paul gave, Rick was in the audience and he had his fans on the run sign up. And Paul uh-huh. sang "Band on the Run" and put the words "fans on the run" in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another great memory for Rick. So. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So good for you, Rick, and uh, and of course, you know, continue with the good health. Absolutely, all all the best, and we'll we'll have you on again soon. Yeah. Also, I thought maybe. If you guys wanted to share in any other particular programs, you wanted to make a few comments on that were that might have been favorites of yours. One uh, of the uh, other ones, one of the other ones I had submitted was um, that we didn't end up using was the Chaz Newby interview, which was from before my time. Hmm. But I found it really interesting. I mean, even though he was in the Beatles for you know basically nanoseconds, mm-hmm. um, he was those were some interesting nanoseconds that he was there, you know, when they got back from Hamburg and needed a bass player. And you know, I I thought he was I it was sort of interesting to hear him because he's a name you read in a book, and hearing him tell his story, his perspective, I thought was just sort of interesting. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Steve? There were a couple. The the Frida Kelly interviews. It was so nice to have her on the show. The couple of times we've had her on, mm-hmm. her and her and Kathy McCabe. But listening to her speak and and talk about the Beatles from her perspective it was just so cool. Another show that was very memorable, and I don't know how we got through that one was the one with Dave Humphreys after Tony Sheridan passed. That yeah. was oh yeah. Oh man, that was that was very emotional. Um, and you can hear it. That, you can hear it in Dave's voice because he's right. close friends with Tony. Right. That was uh, that was that was an amazing show. I'm um, I'm looking down the list here. The Chaz Newby was a great one. The Peter Asher one uh, when uh, he was in Oakland and I was in the hotel room next to, uh, on the other side of the wall at, while, while we were doing because we had to do this from the hotel room that day. And I remember that. That was a great. That was a great one. Uh, the Patty Boyd one was another one that I really, I really liked. Yeah. I do remember one discussion, Ken, between you and I, and, and and this was before Alan Allen came aboard, where we talked about Magical Mystery Tour. Oh yeah. yeah, I remember that <laughs> one very well because I, I can't I, be a favorite of yours. <laughs> I, I didn't say I was a favorite. I just uh-huh. remember that. I just remember that very well because we were you. We were on opposite sides of the fence on that one. We still are. And we. I guess, I guess we still I, are. I listened to the show and I. I was thinking while I'm listening to it. I'm thinking if these two were in the same room, there would have been a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was that was um, that was interesting. That was quite that was quite an interesting show. But yeah, those are I mean, I uh, I think I submitted clips from all of those and we were we were talking about those. Uh, I mean, there were there there were I mean, there have been so many. I mean, you know, to be honest, when we started, Ken, we were just kind of we weren't really positive i mean we knew we were going to stay you know topical but we didn't know exactly how it was going to go and it's really evolved so nicely um you know i mean there's been so many so many great shows the the uh, chuck gunderson shows those yes. have been exceptional mm-hmm. those have been exceptional and chuck if you're listening you will be back my friend yes mm-hmm. in fact it was funny when we um when i i don't know that i told you guys this but when we the um the love uh, show we got my wife and i got into line and there in line right next to us was Ken, was chuck and was uh, like, oh, hello <laughs> <laughs> so we uh i introduced him to my wife and uh we we talked uh, a little bit there and uh 
that was a that was a, a very nice uh, moment. And of course, running into uh, ta- ta- meeting Alan for the first time in in Vegas was great. Yeah, that, that was, was fun. That was uh, <laughs> we had we had a lot of fun that weekend. That was. Uh, that was something that was hot as hell. I, I noticed, by the way, I've been keeping track of the uh, the temperature. It is now down to, I think it was an, an 80 or a 90, 80, I think it was 80 the other day, which would have been a lot nicer for all, for everyone concerned. But, um, boy, that's that's a weekend I'm not going to forget anytime soon. But, yeah. anyway. Al, how about you? Well, what I've got is more of a comment than uh, than uh, than any particular shows, because I'm a I've become a voracious podcast listener. Um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a radio geek anyway, and since. <laughs> There's not that much on radio anymore that's uh, uh, you know either entertaining or informative. Uh, I've kind of gradually transformed over to becoming a listener of podcasts, and I listen. I mean, of all types, whether it's sports, politics, music. Mm-hmm. including the various Beatles podcasts. And I think what the, what, and, and including this one, because I, you know, I listen, I listen to these shows as well. And just as a listener, I like this show because we don't do shtick. We don't, uh, we don't do elitist, you know, down the nose <laughs> um, uh, treatises on how, on the, the, so-called mainstream and how they don't matter uh and except for and, me right except for alan, <laughs> except for alan but 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 that's that's alan's job i mean he's you know he's he gets paid to do that stuff uh, <laughs> we're paying him and no 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 he does it very do. well too and well, Mark, uh, yeah it. really better than me <laughs> and we don't do uh uh you know idle speculation about things that uh, basically never happened. So, uh, so yeah, in all, that all, scene, our, all, all our stuff that we speculate comes true. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I and, and so, the, so the shows actually that I enjoy probably more than the interview shows are the ones where we do, as I call it, a, you know, a virtual roundtable. Mm-hmm. Where we discuss things, whether it's a particular theme or what's happening in the news or whatever, and so just as a as a listener, I enjoy things we said today very much. Can I mention a couple of other um, other shows that that sure I really like the, the appearances with Candy Leonard. I loved mm-hmm. uh, Candy. Candy was a great interview. Candy, if you're listening, thank you. The Spicer times we've had Bruce Spicer on the show; those are awesome. And the and the one and one show that sticks in my mind that's probably the the geekiest show that we did was the Beatle covers, when Alan and I were, mm-hmm. were going back and forth with, and Alan revealed his uh, his absolutely infinite collection of covers. Uh, <laughs> um, that was the, I love that I I thought that was uh, fantastic and also the Billy J having Billy J and mm-hmm. Duke Kessler and also those were. I mean, I, and I'm almost, it, it's, it, you know, if I don't mention every every single person we've had on, Dave Swenson, Anthony Robustelli, I mean, there there have been so many great people that we've had on this on this show. Uh, Mark Lapidus, you know, we've just had so many wonderful guests. We've been really lucky to have all the people we have. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You know, I, I, since we're, you know, doing some sort of self back padding, which I guess we're enttitled to do on. Why not? So, yeah. um, you know, I think we, we've been getting um, actually more mail than usual at our email address, which, by the way, is things we said today, radio show at Gmail dot com mm-hmm. um, from people who seem to be sort of working their way through the whole collection because they're, they're commenting on things that we did way long ago. And then they'll come back a, a couple of days later with a co- um, comment from another show a few weeks forward. And all of these shows are on iTunes and Podbeam, right? YouTube mostly. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, I would encourage anyone who enjoys the show to sort of go back and catch some of the ones you missed because, mm-hmm. um, 
know, some of it is topical and it, you know, more to do with things happening that week. But a lot of these interviews with, with, that we've had are, are uh, you know, in, in a certain way timeless. You know, it's it's good information and uh, in some cases stuff that you haven't heard elsewhere. And there was, a, well, at least one case where we actually did a show on the fly, and that was the uh, the morning that the news broke that Cynthia Lennon had passed. We <laughs> were scheduled to do a taping anyway, and we decided, you know, on the fly to basically get together and do, you know, very, very much off the cuff, a, uh, you know, an appreciation of Cynthia Lennon. And that's mm-hmm. that is another one of the shows that is that as Matt Allen just mentioned is available online, and it's and that, uh, and that one got a lot of uh, that. There was a real spike in listeners for that show, which was really interesting. And we've also gotten some criticism about some of the stuff that we said in there, like we were trying to be less than reverential to to her. And I want to make it clear that we were not. That is not the case. We were we were I mean, I mean we were discussing the way things were, but we were not trying to be irreverent to see. Right. And plus we were we were, you know, flying by the seat of our pants on that one because as I said, we, you know, literally had decided on the spur of the moment to do that show. So Right. Right. Yeah. Well I, I have to pretty much agree with what everyone has said here. I love the balance between having shows with interviews and shows that are just us. And mm-hmm. I also think that one of the advantages that we have in doing this show almost every single week is that we can talk about what's going on in the news almost immediately after it happens. And yep. so, uh, you know, that's a great advantage in having a show like this. So we're still keeping the news very important. The Beatles are not just pure nostalgia to us. So, uh, you know, for that particular reason, I really appreciate the show with this, with this format. Um, some of my favorite shows, as I mentioned, uh, The Beatles' Greatest Miracles, I liked a lot. Many of the interviews. There's so many really good interviews uh, in the early period when it was just Steve and me. And I always remember there was a period of something like two months when it was one author after another who had a new mm-hmm. book out. And I was just so worn out from reading, <laughs> you know, week mm-hmm. after week, all these new books. And every single one of them were good. You know, we've been very Mm -hmm. fortunate in recent years to have excellent books come out, you know, whether it's Mark Lewison or uh, Kevin Howlett, uh, Jim Birkenstadt's book on Jimmy Nickel. Uh, He was a really good interview, too. Chuck Gunderson, we've said before. Uh, Kid O'Toole, Jude Kessler, when it was, you know, all of us here. But there's so many really good interviews that we've done. You know, it's something really to be proud of. Dave Swenson, mm-hmm. sure. And actually, one show that I was not in that I really enjoyed was the one when Dave Morell was on the show, because he's not only a Beatle fan, but he's also an industry insider who could talk about you know what the music industry is like and some of the experiences that he's had, you know, mm-hmm. as, as someone who worked at a record company and had to deal with radio stations and and promoting stuff. You know, I really like that show a lot. Um, there's just so many really good shows. I, you mentioned, as far as geeky, Steve, the uh, the cover versions. I liked when we mentioned the artists that we'd like to see the Beatles work with, or in the case of mm-hmm. John and George, if they were still alive, who we'd like to see them work with. And we did like two shows of that, and that was a lot of fun to do. So, um, you know, it's it's having this variety in the show where we can pretty much talk about almost anything we want to talk about. There's hardly you, anything we've ever disagreed on as far as the topic. It's that's mm-hmm. pretty good, you know. Ninety nine percent of the topics we agree on here on this show. So um, mm-hmm. that's the strength of of having the four of us uh, do this every week. You mentioned one thing earlier about the news after show that I, I think should be mentioned is that we have, you know, four. There are four of us. Two of us who have solid news con- business connections, and two mm-hmm. of us who are who have solid music connections so we've got both perspectives you know i mean alan and i have been in the news business have worked for daily newspapers uh currently write for you know respected publications um and you guys and ken you have been in the radio business and al uh you've you know been with uh 
with Beetle Fan and with the with the Fest. I mean, there's and and you know your background you know has other connections too. I mean, we have mm-hmm. there's a lot of experience among us. You know, we may be we're you know we've got we've got the experience. So um, I think that lends a lot to the conversation as well. And not only that, I mean, I've never talked about this openly with my listeners, but, um, and I don't want this to come across as being a knock on a previous show that I was on, but I do feel that if you're going to do a show on the Beatles, if you can do it, you should have at least one person in the show that lived through it and really experienced it and can share those memories. You know, I was born in 1959. I have a lot of very vivid memories of the 60s as a little kid, but I didn't fully absorb it, you know, the way a teenager or maybe someone in their 20s did. But it's nice to have other people that you're working with that can add that perspective to what it was like, you know. And it's also important to have the perspective of younger people, too, because, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be passing the torch (laughs) to younger people in radio who never lived through the 60s never lived through the height of the solo Beatles popularity, you know, and they have Mm -hmm. their own take on it. And we might not agree with their perspective on it, but it's interesting to have different opinions. But I do think that it is important if you can do it to have someone in this case, I have three other people here who remember the sixties far better than I could. So, you know, I think that that's uh, you know, that's a strength to the show. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we can reveal Ken that, it never really happened. Okay. The moon landing <laughs> was real. The moon landing was real, but the rest of the sixties were the rest fake. of it was a dream. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> oh well. Really, there was only Motown in the sixties, right? Mm-hmm. That was it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Mo- Motown and Bo Donaldson and the Haywoods. No, that's seventies. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so before we go, uh, I just want to make sure, because it's very easy for me to forget things, to thank a few people. First of all, there's a guy named Michael Lynch, who has been a, a guest here on this yes. show or several times. Thank you, Michael. Who yeah. also composed our music theme that you hear at the very beginning, at the very end. And all of you listening have said to us how catchy that song is and how, you know, you can't get that out of your head after you listen to our show. But to thank Michael... <laughs> for composing that theme for us and for being a great guest, and we'll probably have you on again. Also want to thank Darren DeVivo and Tom Franjone for being semi-regulars here on this show and adding so much Mm -hmm. to the conversations here. And also to thank all the listeners who have been with us, whether from the beginning or whether you're newbies, because we really appreciate having you here, and uh, it's because of your reaction to our records that really matters. (laughs) We've been getting... getting Yeah, I know. We've been we've been getting about that. We've been getting a couple uh, thousands of downloads every week, so we appreciate all of that. Mm-hmm. So okay. So, do any of us want to just plug anything before we go? Uh, Steve, you had a couple of news things, didn't you? Boy, I, we had looked through we had looked through the Billboard charts, and I put them and I took them off my screen. Um, the, well, uh, we should we should point out, especially for those people who have who have been calling uh, eight days a week, now, anthology yeah. light, mm-hmm. you know, and all this nonsense. Right. That, that the the film has now been held over for a third week, with even more theaters added on. So, yeah, there were, you know, there were missed opportunities. It's not by any means perfect. It is, you know, it's probably a little too aimed at millennials. But as in the case of uh, at least one other Beatles album that will go on unmentioned, uh, (laughs) uh, it, you know, you can't you can't fight success. Right. And uh, and at least at this point. Eight days a week has been a uh, has been a, a surprise box office success. Yeah, I I just did a story for Billboard um, that you should find online that um, goes through has comments from the distributor and from a box office, somebody that uh, deals with box office data and they both said that that the film had done very well considering it was a limited you know it was basically a limited engagement film yeah and and the demand for the film has and and also the fact that hulu picked it up 
the day after it's you know it, it right. came to the theaters, which you know that still astonishes me that it's doing that well because people can pick it up at home. You know, yeah. I mean, the fact that it's streaming and it's and it's still it has staying power power in the theater is is something to be noticed. And I, yeah. That's the fact you know, that, really that any documentary of any kind could be mm-hmm. in the movie theaters for this long, and we're talking three weeks. Oh, that, right. That is that is amazing to itself. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's usually, I mean, it's usually the controversial documentaries or the political documentaries that get that kind of stuff. That's not the case here at all. So. Right, like a Michael Moore, something, right? Something like that. Exactly. But, but yeah. but you know I mean I'm sure that you know the fact that they're you know they're showing the 30 minute cut of Shea Stadium, I'm sure that's you know a little bit of an inducement. But still, sure. uh, you know I think there are a lot of people that are going to see it that I have no idea about about the the Shea Stadium uh, cut. You know at this point they're you know dare I say it casual fans who uh, just want to see the film. Right. So catch it while you can. Catch it while you can to twist the uh, name of a Dave Clark Five song, but because it will not be there forever. And when right. it comes out, when it comes out on DVD, you won't get the Shea stuff. Uh, right. At yeah. least not in that format. That's according to what we're hearing. So, but in any event, there we go. Okay. So if you want to get in touch with us, Steve, why don't you tell the folks for you how they can do so? Well, uh, as Alan said earlier, the show can be reached at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear your your praise or your criticism or ideas for the show. Um, you can get me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, as a bunch of people have found out um, this week. And uh, I have a <laughs> news group. Oh, I won't. I, 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 I should say, well, I don't know if I should say it here, but I get into political discussions and I've been hearing from that uh, this week. But also, but uh, I'm also, I also have a Beatles news group that I promise won't get political, or at least I hope not. And uh, it's uh, Beatles news and commentary. And uh, it's got uh, 4,000 members now. I mean, we got, we got quite a group there. Wow. And, uh, so um, uh, come on board and, and uh, we'll talk, uh, talk Beatles news. All right, Alan, how about you? Um, you can find me on Facebook as well, uh, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, send me a note, make a comment. I'll get back to you. All right, Al? And uh, you can follow, me, uh, find me on Facebook, also under Al Sussman, or on Twitter uh, at uh, ASUSS49. Uh, or you can get in touch with me through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can email me directly at everylittlething at att.net. You can also check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Uh, just a couple of things about the website on my weekly Beatles trivia and games page. I am now giving away the Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl CD. Um, also, I'm giving away a pair of tickets to see Chad and Jeremy in concert live at Daryl's house in Pauling, New York. And by the way, if you happen to have read Steve's own article on Chad and Jeremy, they did announce that they're scaling back their touring. So uh, if you want to see them, and I, I could tell you, I, I first caught them in concert about 10 years ago, and mm-hmm. I swear, if you close your eyes, they sound exactly the same, mm-hmm. just 50 years older. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, they're just amazing how, you know, vocally, they could do this stuff in their sleep. But um, Can I, oh, can yeah. I interject something? I yeah. just found out today, for those of you thinking about going to Chad and Jeremy, that they will be selling a, uh, a special CD at their shows, mm-hmm. an, uh, an anthology. So um, there's another reason to go see them. Yeah. Yeah, well, the tickets that I have is for Daryl's house on October the 13th. And if you visit the uh, concerts and events page on my website, it explains how you can win. It's really simple. So uh, apart from seeing great performers like uh, Chad and Jeremy, Denny Lane, I just gave tickets away, you get to see some of the great venues in the New England area. So if you live in that area, uh, you know, I'm really happy to be 
you know, exposing people to some of these venues. And one more thing, um, I was just interviewed by a fellow Beatle DJ by the name of Steve Ludwig, who has mm-hmm. a show called The Beatles Hour, and it's on his own website where you can find a lot of interviews that he's done with lots of celebrities, which uh, is Planet Ludwig, as in Ludwig <laughs> Drums, planetludwig.com. Click on The Beatles Hour, and you can hear a full interview with me and uh, playing some Beatles music, too, in the show. Steve did a great job. Thank you for having me on, Steve. And so if you want to check that out, again, that's planetludwig.com. Yeah, I'm not sure how far back his archives go, but uh, he did interview me back in, uh, I guess it was in 2013, when uh, when Changing Times came out. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, but again, I don't know how far how far back his archives go. We'll have to check his website to see. Yeah. Hmm. Anything else anyone wants to add? Nope. Just come back and listen to us again next week. Right? So on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, and Al Sussman, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for supporting things we said today. And we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>